Many of the theorems that we had before for functions of Euclidean space, namely differentiable or CR functions of open domains in Euclidean spaces, transfer to differentiable functions and CR functions between manifolds. So for example, uh, we have the chain rule for manifolds if m, n, and p are differentiable manifolds and we have a function f from n to n, n to m, uh, a differentiable function from p to n, and we always remember that we have this composition here, and c is a point, let's say, in p, and g is differentiable at c, and f is differentiable at g of c, then this diagram, where we have differentiable functions now, goes to another diagram, but this time of vector spaces and linear transformations. And here we have f of g of c, m, that's a vector space. That's an m-dimensional vector space if the dimension of m is n, m. Uh, we have f, sorry, g of c here for n, and tcp for this uh, linear, for this vector space. So here we take the differential of G. Here, what do we take? We look at the image of G under this transformation. That's G of C. That's the point that we're looking at. So we take the differential of this function at that point. So this is G, sorry, this is D at the point GC of the function F. And the claim is that this composition equals the differential of, at the point C, of F composed with G. So the chain rule just says that the composition of differentiable functions is differentiable, and its derivative, its differential, is given by the composition of the respective linear transformations. So this is one theorem that's true. There's another theorem that's also true, the inverse function theorem. also follows for manifolds. And what this is essentially saying is that if you have a point, if you have a differentiable function, let's say CR just in case, of, of manifolds of some appropriate smoothness condition, let's say CR, then, and you have a differentiable function and you know that the determinant of that linear transformation is non-zero, so remember what that means, First of all, that will only make sense for manifolds of the same dimension. Secondly, the determinant, you can either compute it using a basis, but you know that the, the determinant of a linear transformation is independent of such a choice of basis. Uh, so it still makes sense whether or not you calculate it with respect to a basis. And it's also true that there exists an open neighborhood around that point and an open neighborhood in the codomain of that manifold around the image point and there's a diffeomorphism between those two open sets. So that inverse function theorem also holds for manifolds. And the proofs of these theorems, now that we know the facts in Euclidean spaces, are far simpler. Um, they're essentially just diagram chases. Drawing the appropriate diagram and transferring the theorem from Euclidean space to the case of manifolds, most often using charts. Or in this case, for instance, since our manifolds of, are subsets of Euclidean space, we can just use extensions and the theorem we had about independence of extensions. Third, level sets of regular values of differentiable functions between manifolds now. Before we talked about differentiable functions between Euclidean spaces or open subsets of them are manifolds. And this last one is so important that I want to reiterate what the definitions were. So recall that if we have a differentiable function from one manifold to another, that a point C in N is a critical point 
if and only if the differential of f at c, which is, just to remind you, just it always helps to keep writing this over and over and over again so you see the picture. It's the tangent space of n at c to the tangent space of m at the image point. If and only if this linear transformation is not onto. So if the span of the image of all of these vectors does not equal the tangent space of the manifold M at that point, then that point is said to be a critical point. And the set of critical points, again, are denoted by CF. A point R in M is a regular value if and only if R is in M minus the image of the critical points of F. So it's so if you look at all the set of critical points and you map them into M, that's going to be a bunch of points in M. Anything that's in M that's not in that image is a regular value. Doesn't matter if it gets hit by the function M at all. It doesn't have to be in the image of F as long as it's not in the image of the critical points. And then finally, a regular point of f is an element of. Now what we're doing is we're taking the regular values and pulling them back to n. So by the way, we call regular values rf. So it's the inverse image of rf. And we have this fantastic theorem that's still true. And rather than writing it, since I've already stated it here, uh, remember the level set, if I have a function f from n to m, then the level set says pick a value in the codomain. So pick an element l, let's say. So the theorem says, I guess it's helpful to rewrite it, if l is in the set of regular values for f in the notation above, then f inverse of l is an n minus m dimensional manifold. And again, the proof of this theorem uh, I've actually given uh, a proof from scratch because I didn't prove the initial one for open subsets of Rn. But if I had proven the theorem for subsets of Rn, I could have also used the simpler diagrammatic method and transferred that theorem from open subsets into the case of manifolds. So let's look at an example, one that we're probably already quite familiar with, but I, I really like this one because it illustrates a lot of the key features of regular points, critical points, and all that. Um, if we take the height function on the torus, and in the notes I have an explicit parameterization so that you see exactly how this works. Um, I take the height function, and so here, uh, here's r, here's our manifold m. In this case, I've chosen n. Well, I guess in terms of notation, let me call this n, just to be consistent. Um, the target space M I've chosen to just be R itself. And so this point here is a regular value. And we can actually prove that by calculating the tangent space at every point and then showing that it's onto on that, on that regular value. And you can sort of visually see this because the tangent space here is sort of tilted. If the tangent space was ever um, parallel, if, the, if I drew this in the x, y, z plane, and this vertical axis here was like the z axis, then any time that the plane, the tangent plane, is parallel to the x, y plane, that's when I know I'm going to have a critical point. And you can see that that only occurs for four points visually from this picture, at one at the top, one at the time where this hole appears at the bottom. There's sort of like a saddle shape going on. It's curving in this way in one direction and in this way in the other. And then there's another saddle here, so there's another horizontal plane. And then at the bottom, there's another horizontal plane. So those four points, I don't expect this theorem to be true. 
And indeed, at this point, I have a manifold. I actually have a manifold. That's uh, not always the case. But it's not an n minus m dimensional manifold. It's an n minus m minus 1 dimensional manifold. At this point here, I have this figure 8. And we know that that's not a manifold. And here I also have another figure 8. And at the bottom, I have a point. But everywhere else, I have an n minus m dimensional manifold, even way up here. Up there, it's the empty set. But the empty set happens to be a manifold of every dimension. So um, I'll let you think about why, that, it's, the why that's true from the definition. Uh, it's, it's a nice way of getting rid of um, anything. You don't have to worry about the empty set knowing that fact. So again, for the proof of this theorem, I'll refer you to the notes.